Hi, I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. Michigan has over 11,000 inland lakes. Many of our lakes are healthy, but many are not, and apparently what we do on land can make all the difference. According to the National Lake Assessment, the biggest threat to our lakes is loss of natural shoreline habitat. Today our guest is Julia Kirkwood from the Water Resources Division of the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Julia is co-author of a guidebook for property owners produced by the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership about natural shoreline landscaping. Julia, welcome to the show. Thank you. I found this guidebook to be extremely useful. It's got all kinds of um, case studies that talk about specific challenges and how um, you solve them. It has uh, lots of great before and after pictures. It also has eight pages of species that can be used along shorelines, and they're divided into um, sections according to where on the shoreline they are most adapted. For instance, in the water or near the ordinary high water mark, which is where the water meets the land, or higher up um, upland areas, drier plants, and they're divided into what needs shade, what needs sun. It's really, really useful. Another resource is A Home on the Shore, a video produced for the Beaver Island Association funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're going to start off by showing the section of this video on native vegetation. Let's take a look. At one point, these entire lake shorelines were, were natural and the water quality was at its peak. And through development, we're seeing water quality degrading in a lot of the lakes. With development has come lawns and that clean edge look. But I think a lot of people don't understand the impacts of that nice clean edge. You establish that lawn, you place fertilizers on the lawn. That fertilizer, uh, I think the, the statistics are that maybe 50% of the fertilizer might be used up at the most. And if there's a seawall and it's lawn right to the edge, it's just pouring right into the lake. Uh, and there's nothing stopping it. There's no uh, buffering going on. The roots of turf grass are only a few inches deep and don't filter pollutants as do the roots of native plants. Wherever you're near water, for at least 15 feet to the waterway, you should have rooted plants, not cultivars and ornamental plants, because their root systems are not very deep. A native plant has five times the root system as a cultivated plant. Nutrients, if allowed to get into our waterways, increase the weed and algae growth. When a lake starts to fill in with greenery, that's the beginning of the death of the lake. Lakes come and go in nature, but it's over hundreds of years. It's not over a 10-year period or five-year period. We are using so much fertilizer, and we are letting so many things go into the waterway. And we need a mechanism to remove those nutrients. In front of our homes, those wetlands are essentially the last line of defense. That's where it happens. By reverting to a natural shoreline, we're able to bring it back to what the, the pristine nature, the clean, the high water quality that it once was. Uh, the DNR currently recommends that people try to uh, keep at least 75 percent of their shoreline natural and then maintain as much buffer as possible. We see benefits from any buffer. All of this belting that you see between here and the house, should there be any runoff, there's a huge aquifer underneath here. So the quality of that water deep down is incredibly important because that is our well water. Removing the buffers can kick off a series of unintended negative consequences. When you put a seawall in, that wave energy comes up, hits the, hits the seawall and either refracts back and then down cuts the bottom. So you end up with deeper habitat, so you lose your shallow water habitat, which is some of our most critical habitat to maintaining uh, fish populations in these lakes. Roots are stronger than rocks, and rocks are stronger than steel. It can be hard to understand how a vegetated buffer can be stronger than a steel wall. With a seawall... The waves are diverted sideways, and they cause an increased erosion onto the adjacent properties. Typically, that's when we see them coming in asking for additional seawalls uh, because they have to do something. They're having huge impacts. Impacts to wildlife can be profound when natural vegetation is replaced by rock or a seawall. They disrupt any uh, wildlife migration from the lake. Most animals can't get over um, a, a vertical wall. 
and having uh, inputs of, of organic material, the leaves and uh, other things that are on trees. The bugs are falling in and feeding the fish and they're shading the water. When you have a seawall that's made of steel, the water gets too hot there and the fish won't stay there. Especially the small fish to come in here and to hide from the large predators. Even a small area like this just critical to maintaining that habitat feature and to maintaining the fisheries. You get the rocks, the bulrush is just stopped. Mechanical grooming of beaches can destroy crucial habitat and invite invasives. It's okay to remove some of the aquatic plants manually so you do have a swimming area, but people should understand, try to realize how important they are for the lake ecosystem. And we look at something like this and we may think that it's not significant to the overall system, but in fact it is. If we looked at the number of invertebrates in this vegetation in a very small area about this big, about a meter square, we would find about 50,000 in that area. And that's an enormous amount of fish food. There is a widely held belief that natural vegetation encourages mosquitoes. But Dr. Uzarski's research found this not to be true on our shorelines. We collected 56,000 invertebrates from greater than 63 coastal wetlands around the Great Lakes. And of those, we had 80 mosquitoes. So essentially, you would have more mosquitoes in a tin can that you left in your backyard that filled up with water because vegetated areas along the shoreline are not actually good mosquito habitat, very poor mosquito habitat. The wildlife that native habitat does increase are those that enhance our enjoyment of our shore property. I don't even know how many hundreds of migratory species of birds. Uh, when the cedar wax wings comes through, there's hundreds eating all the bugs. Um, Sandhill cranes fly by. Um, I have nesting eagles over here. Our valuable native vegetation often requires protection. To walk over beach grass will reduce their ability to hold on to the land and you increase the erosion. The answer is to put in clearly marked walkways. This gives you an obvious path to follow and keeps people from traipsing up and down the steepest part of the, of the dune structure. Or plant beach grass that is certified to be native, available from your local soil conservation district. Trees are important buffers too. Not only do their roots hold the soil and filter pollutants, but their branches protect your home from the wind. We certainly didn't want to cut all the trees down in front of the house because we wanted the protection in the winter time. If it's uh, 10 degrees and the wind's blowing 30 knots, you just don't want to be exposed. Trim your trees for a filtered view under the upper branches instead of cutting the tree down altogether. So we just really started to just uh, take the dead limbs off the bottoms of the trees and just started to see what we, our view was going to be before we got too carried away and started cutting. And we found that we had to do very, very little. Prune deadwood for a view, but leave it where it provides essential wildlife habitat. We always deliberately leave the wood on the spot where it, unless it's an obstruction, because we know that it's, it provides habitat for huge numbers of insects, salamanders, and it, it will break down, it will add to the nutrients of the soil. We have um, porcupines that made a nest in a rotten stump, and they had a little nest. Julia, your guidebook talks about how um, in nature, before development, shorelines were heavily forested, and now we've converted a lot of the shorelines to lawns. Now, why is that? The lawns are, you asked me if the lawns are a problem for the lakes? Yeah, what is the problem with lawns? What happens is with the lawns, it takes away the native plants that were originally there. Mm -hmm. And when you take away the, those plants, you take away food and shelter for a lot of the other animals, or a lot of the animals that would live there, both on the shoreline and in the water. And some need water as well as the land for part of their life cycle. So you take away that habitat as part of that lawn when you create that lawn. The other thing is with the lawn, you create habitat as well for something else, and that's typically geese. It's an, oh. an excellent uh, habitat for geese. And the, another important thing is that the lawn has very short, shallow roots compared to the native plants that are there. And that lawn is not adapted to holding the soil in place against wave energy that's coming up against the shoreline. Mm -hmm. and, that, and all those waves that come and beat against that shoreline eventually cause that to erode. 
-hmm. And then the next thing that happens is that seawalls end up going in place. And that takes away, uh, that puts in another series of problems mm -hmm. for the lakes as well. Kind of a domino effect. It is. And with geese, why do they like lawns so much? Geese, their natural habitat and life cycle, whatever, is they are grazers. Oh. And what they w want is a wide open space because it's safe against predators. Mm -hmm. They can go up there. They, don't, they can see uh, from predators coming up towards them. And it's safe for their babies. Mm -hmm. The other thing is a lawn, you know, as they're grazers, it creates an excellent smorgasbord for you know, all night diner for them, an all day diner. So they don't have to go anywhere. It's easy for them. Hmm. If there's the native vegetation, you know, it makes it a little more difficult. They're a little more hesitant to go up through things that might become a problem hmm. for them. And here it says something about you need uh, six feet or so of uh, buffer. It's not just a few plants because right. they can get through a few plants, but you need a good solid buffer. Yeah, at a, usually at about a minimum is about six feet. They will go through it. Hmm. However, if they have an easier place to go to, a place where there isn't the six foot buffer and it's really dense, they're gonna go there. Mm -hmm. It's just, it makes it easier for them. Mm -hmm. And why are geese such a nuisance? I mean, aside from we don't like to step in their um, goose poop, but <laughs> why do we really wanna avoid having an overpopulation of geese? They, well, because of the, the goose droppings, I mean, it does c create um, a nutrient problem okay. for the lakes, the excessive nutrients from the phosphorus standpoint. And then they're, they're e the E. coli aspect from the goose droppings. There are some beach areas that um, actually have an E. coli problem due to the concentration of geese. Wow. Um, and the lawns are a, uh, a, an aesthetic choice, which is kind of interesting because it, up north, for instance, you don't see the lawns as much along the shorelines, but in the more urban areas mm -hmm. down south, it seems to be a very um, popular choice. And I often hear people say that it's because children like to play in lawns, but I know that my kids and my nieces and nephews, they make a beeline for the natural areas where they can find toads and turtles and overturn logs and find you know, cool flowers. I'm, I'm just wondering if maybe we, there's other reasons why people feel they need to have lawns. Well, I think it's mostly just an individual choice and what we've learned is, is what you're supposed to do along, on, along the lake shore. You're supposed to come in, put in a seawall, and put in a lawn. Hmm. Uh, sometimes it's just a, like a domino effect where your neighbor has put in a seawall. Well, that seawall causes problems for the next neighbor because the waves energy are deflected and, and pushed over onto the next property owners. So their shoreline erodes. So the next seawall comes in and it's just a domino effect along the shoreline. And a lot of it is, is a personal effect. You, if you're moving from the city which has lawn, you want to come to the shoreline and it makes you feel it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. Do you have suggestions for how people should let their neighbors know why they have planted a buffer? Well there are different ways to do that is one is not only a why they're doing it but the fact that they are doing it and to make help them feel more, more comfortable sometimes it's, it's a neighbor reaction um, there are different ways that a buffer can be created one is an, you just create a no mow zone that one tends to be a little less attractive to your neighbors because it's a little more random and it's um, not as um, they can be a little have a little more weedy look to it that one is typically more acceptable in, in, a, in more like northern Michigan where you have lots of property. Another one is that you create a landscape that's a little more organized. Uh, it's like your typical landscaping. And then you create nice borders as well as long as like it's supposed to be there. Okay. Another way is that I know there are people that have, some lake associations have adopted programs that have signs out there that uh, basically state that the, this natural area is helping the lake. They're uh, lake, lake shore friendly or helping to clean the lake. Mm -hmm. So in, lake associations can really help with that education as well. I saw that up at Burt Lake. Uh, the sign said this, uh, this green belt is cleaning our lake. Okay. Yeah, they're very nice. Um, also, uh, the bulrushes. The movie talked about how um, bulrushes are really great for the fish for mm -hmm. um, protection, the young fish. Uh, I, do you think bulrushes kind of have a bad rap in terms of people feeling that they're weedy? Um, 
you know, and feeling like they need to get rid of them, whereas we really probably should try to change our thinking about mm -hmm. how. Yeah, I think that's the biggest challenge of creating natural shorelines is thinking differently, thinking what a shoreline is supposed to be and what it's supposed to look like. The plants that historically were in the lake were there for a reason. It's not just the bulrushes or the lily pads. You know, they do have, a weed is essentially defined as a plant that you don't want there. Mm -hmm. um, so they can get the, the bad rap of being a weed, but those are plants that are supposed to be there. It protects the lake shore and it creates habitat, not just for fish, but for frogs. It creates fish, there's fish food in there. It protects, um, there's birds that use those habitats. So if, you, if there's a way that homeowners can share the lake with those plants, they'll, find a much health, they'll end up finding a much healthier lake. Mm -hmm. And I read in here that um, something I hadn't thought of, that, that those plants keep the sediments down so the lake yeah. is less, less turbidity, and I guess fish need the l lake to be clear. Um, so that was... Yeah, so what happens is that with the plants there, when the waves come in, the waves don't stir up all of that sediment. They're, those plants are helping keep, reduce the energy that the waves are coming so that sediment stays in place. It, if you go in and you start churning up, it, it's obviously going to be churned up. But for the most part, the waves will come in and the energy will be lower and that turbidity. If those plants are removed, then when the waves come in, it stirs up all that bottom sediment and it creates much um, cloudy water, turbid water, that the fish cannot live in. And also, it ends up covering up and um, all the waves come in and destroy like the spawning areas. So there isn't a place uh -huh. anymore for certain fish to come in and lay their eggs. Hmm. And uh, deadwood seems to have a bad rep too, in terms of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. what, what's the importance of deadwood on the shore? Well, the deadwood will create um, nice areas where fish can come in and hide. Uh, there will be fish food, something like if, you know, the caddis flies, and the dragonflies, their life cycle starts in the water. Some of them live their entire life cycle in the water. They come out for about 24 hours, like caddisflies or mayflies, as an adult form, and that's about it. Uh, that creates a place where that kind of um, insect can live, and then the frogs would come in, you know, frogs can come in and hide underneath there as well. It provides, again, a place for animals to hide that are living in the water. Mm -hmm. And when you remove that, there's no place for them to hide and feel safe. Must be, um, fish must eat caddisflies larvae, I don't know, but this book yeah. says that something like 15 species of fish can be living in one submerged log, which was really a lot of fish. Yeah, so obviously it depends on the size of the log and the, and yeah. the area and the different lake, but there have been quite a few studies that show that the amount of fish that actually utilize those areas where there's vegetation is, is quite significant. And another thing we were talking about um, in the movie is that um, animals need to go up the shore to get in and out, many species do. And, but before the um, interview today, you mentioned that it's also along the shore that animals need to be able to travel, mm -hmm. kind of like a, in a corridor. Can you address that? Yes, well there's a lot of animals that need the lake, and then they also need the shoreline. And one of the reasons why they need the shoreline, for example, are turtles. They live in the lake, but they need to come up and lay their eggs. And they're not usually going to come up and immediately lay their eggs. They're going to go places where the, it's, for whatever reason, is, r feels right for them. We need roads that are safe and obstruction free. Animals need roads that actually have things that hide them. Mm -hmm. So they need the, the, the plants to create a safe place for them to travel. Otherwise, they're afraid that obviously that something's going to eat them. So that the plant cor corridor, the along the shoreline creates a safe place for them to travel between the areas. Well, you have a lot of different options in here for ways people can create these buffers, and some of them are not really do-it-yourself projects. How can people find someone that can help them with that? The, one of the first goals and objectives of the Michigan Natural Shoreline uh, Partnership was to create a certified natural shoreline professional program. And there are over 40 professionals now certified, and there will be more um, c come middle of the summer. And all of these professionals are listed on the Shoreline Partnerships website mm -hmm. for people to go to, and they can find which, and their contact information is there, and they can find which contractor is closest to them. Okay, great. And, and all of these contracts have been trained 
in the techniques of, in, the, in the consistent message of what we're, we're aiming for. Um, it's what, a four-day training program? That it you is have? a four-day training, and it's a three-day classroom training, and there's a, a field component where they actually go out and install a more complex system. All of these, what we're really focusing are shorelines that have what we call low energy, where there's not a lot of waves coming in. Maybe the backwater areas, very calmer areas, where the banks are low, there's not a huge, not a huge erosion problem. There may be some, and maybe somebody's contemplating putting in a seawall. Um, but we can change that. We can provide alternatives and more natural shorelines, more a living shoreline. We filmed um, your installation last spring at Ford Lake, where you were having a training, and uh, it showed the coir log ins being installed. What is a coir log? A coir log is essentially a log made out of coconut fiber. It's rolled coconut fiber. And what this does is it provides a uh, place that plants can grow into. It's biodegradable. It's environmentally friendly. And eventually, you place that along the shoreline. The waves can come in. And eventually, um, that stalls the erosion, protects the, the shoreline. And the plants will grow into it and around it. And that coir log will eventually biodegrade. What will be remaining will be a stable shoreline and a living shoreline. And the plants will maintain it. I read that coir is actually, um, you mentioned it's from coconut, mm -hmm. and it's uh, frequently um, a byproduct of coconut uh, processing in countries like India where it's going to be thrown away anyway, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a really nice sustainable product to be using. Yeah, they're very, um, they're heavy. Um, it's not a job that uh, people can do themselves, that, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted the certified professionals to do is to learn how to do it properly and correctly. Because there are things that y you do with it, it just doesn't get installed correctly, and there's no sense doing that um, in incorrectly because then you just waste your time and money, and um, people will get discouraged about that technique. Um, another thing that's mentioned um, is, l uh, excuse me, live stakes and wattles. Can you okay. address what those are? Well, live stakes. Um, these are just essentially different techniques, uh, plant techniques, uh, to help stabilize the shoreline. Live stakes would be an example of like a red osier dogwood, where basically you, you cut a live plant. You have to do it when they're dormant, and you have to, st basically what you do is just stick them in the ground, and it's just stakes um, before they start growing, and then they'll eventually grow. It's not something that anybody would use um, unless you have a longer shoreline or, and you're okay with having shrubs. In s many areas, you just have a short shoreline of your own and you don't want to obstruct that with, with the shrubs. But those are the or, techniques that... Or maybe that if your house is on an um, incline, I was thinking you could see over the shrubs. Maybe. And that's an excellent yeah. um, place to use it. It's, every property is different. The techniques are going to be different. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing, you know, some of it homeowners can do themselves. There's a lot of different things that they can do themselves, but there is a lot of stuff that you really need a professional to help with because it's, it's fairly, com some of them are very complex. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the challenges, uh, let's address those. For instance, um, trying to keep people from stepping on them. Uh, the movie showed the paths that you can put to prevent people from stepping on um, more sandy dune areas, but this, this paths could be something that perhaps could help people from stepping on these new plantings in the inland lakes as well, right? Well, essentially what you do is uh, you, people still want access to the lake. Mm -hmm. They still need an access. So you create a path that does that. Mm -hmm. you, you find what you need, you find what you want, and then you create around that. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, you, if you need a boat access, if you need a place to store your boat, then you, you maintain that. But recognize that there are also areas that you don't really need that can go into a shoreline. The coir log can go along the entire shoreline and just have some plants in it. And behind that, you can still have um, your area that you can play and, and enjoy and relax and also have a path right down to the lake. Uh, I'm reminded of the um, wonderful boardwalk on Burt Lake that uh, is in a s uh, specific neighborhood where I guess the neighbors got together and paid for it because it goes through their various um, N um, yards and it's along the shore and it allows the shore on either side to be na natural because okay. they're able to walk over. It's really pretty. Um, what about uh, grazing of uh, like 
ducks and such uh, nibbling on the new plantings. Is there a way to avoid that? Yeah, and that's actually one of the, um, once you put in the plants, you do need to protect them. There are some examples in, in the guidebook of, of how to create a little maze to keep the ducks and the geese away. The nice, young, fresh plants are, are fairly tasty to them. Once they're grown, once they're in place, it's not usually a problem. You mean a, a maze with string? Oh, a maze with some string, um, some stakes and string, okay. and not just one string across, because geese will eventually learn how to duck onto it, or the babies will. Mm -hmm. um, so you create a, a maze where they can't really walk through it, and it makes it challenging for them. Mm -hmm. And when people have to be gone a lot because it's their summer place and they're not there all the time, is there something they need to make sure that, um, you know, what, what are the, there's some guides, oh, three W's or something. Um. I'll watch water and weed. Oh, okay. okay. That's it. Yeah. When, once you put in a natural shoreline, you're going, you know, you're obviously, these are plants. And historically, people have said, it's like, you know, native plants are low maintenance. They don't use as much water. Well, they still need water, and they still need to be maintained, especially initially. The challenge is to put them in, you know, in the spring, you know, later spring, you know, after frost is done, or end of the summer, early fall. And the reason is that this allows the, the, the plants to, to grow and get the root structures in place. If you put them in in the middle of summer and you're gonna, and you're gonna gone, there needs to be some, some way that those plants are gonna be watered or maintained so you don't lose them. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it looks like we're out of time, unfortunately, but uh, tell us how can people get information on how they can order this guidebook and just in general find okay. out more about this? Well, there is a link to, uh, the, the book is available through the MS Michigan State University's bookstore. The link is on the Natural Shoreline Partnerships website. Um, there's a picture and then the link will take you directly to the page to, to order the book. Great. Well, thanks for being here, Julia. All right. We've also provided links to resources well relevant to this show at ewashtenaw.org forward slash green room. Thanks for joining us here in the green room.